Invariably, the plague doctors conjure images of death, disease, and decay. Their visage is unmistakable. From head to toe, they are covered in black robes, and over their faces is a mask with a cruel, hooked beak. Modern renditions of them are almost universally negative, and they can be found in video games as disease spreaders, mages, or markers of an era. In these incarnations, their aims are typically fiendish and sinister. What better laboratory than the blood-soaked battlefield? Most of these settings hint at the dark history of the Plague Doctors, but the full scope of their practices remains obscure. So who were the Plague Doctors? In order to understand them, one must first understand the terrifying circumstances that brought them about. Between the years 600 and 1300 AD, following a period of stagnation, the population of the world had increased exponentially. These populations gave rise to massive, sprawling, and poorly planned cities, concentrations of humans that had never been seen before in history. Some cities exceeded 100,000 people, and it's believed that Paris passed 200,000. Rural folk migrated into the cities seeking better employment opportunities and education from the universities that had been established a century before, but the life they found was often not as favorable as they had hoped. European cities in the 1300s were stinking and unsanitary. Buildings were mostly dilapidated. The Hundred Years' War had forced most governments to focus on building fortifications rather than maintaining infrastructure, letting the core of the cities deteriorate. There were few methods to preserve food well enough and transport it quickly enough to meet the demands of the cities' populations, causing food prices to bloat. Limited preservation technologies also meant it was impossible to stockpile food in the case of famine. Many of those who had come to the city simply starved and died, and those poor who survived did so with failing health and empty purses. Sanitary conditions in the cities were abysmal. Most districts, especially the poor ones, had no access to plumbing, and so people would relieve themselves in chamber pots and empty them by throwing the contents out the window and onto the street. Though this caused the cities to reek, the connection between excrement and disease was not yet understood, and so this state of affairs was allowed to continue and worsen as city populations increased. Though the reproduction rate in the cities was negative, this was offset by the sheer number of people moving in. Europe had seen few scientific advances for over a millennium, a time known as the Dark Ages, and in some cases, scientific learning had actually been lost. Physicians' understanding of malady had changed little from 400 BC. The dominant medical theory was known as humorism, which stated that each person had a balance of four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. It was believed that when these four humors were out of balance, it would cause illness in the person. It was the role of the physician, then, to balance the humors in their patient. For example, if a person had too much blood, they would slice open their arm and drain some out, a process known as bloodletting. Herbs would be chewed to promote or suppress the creation of certain humors, and cups would be heated and placed on the skin to create suction, pulling and moving humors through the body. The other main theory of disease, known as miasma theory, dictated that illness was spread through bad air, though what constituted bad seems inconsistent. Around this time as well, the Silk Road was being re-established, which reached all the way from the east coast of China to Europe along both land and sea routes. The demand for Chinese goods was extremely high in Europe, and so merchants would commonly make the long trip to sell their wares. But along with these merchants came something else. Before the merchant ships left Chinese harbors, rats would skitter aboard and hide deep in the holds. Upon arriving in Europe, these rats would escape into the coastal towns. Buried in these rats' fur were fleas infested with a bacteria categorized today as Yersinia pestis. The disease reached its first European country, Crimea, in 1343. With trade increasing again during this time, merchants were traveling all over Europe, and along with them came the rats and their fleas. As the rats scattered throughout Europe aboard trade wagons and ships, they spread their fleas with the disease to other rodents as well. 
The bacteria had a unique effect on the fleas. It effectively blocked their digestive tracts, making them voraciously hungry and far more aggressive than they normally would be. When they attempted to eat blood, they would end up vomiting the bacteria into the wound of whatever it bit, meaning that a single bite could easily cause infection. With live animals roaming the filthy streets of the cities, it wasn't long before humans began contracting the disease themselves. The symptoms of infection were brutal and horrific. Two to six days after initial infection, the person would begin to find large lumps filled with pus on their body, specifically on the neck, the groin, and the armpits. Shortly after this, the flesh on the person would begin to die, turning it black. This discoloration of necrotic tissue is where the disease got its name, the Black Death. The victim would afterwards grow delirious with fever and begin vomiting blood. Some suffered pneumonia, their lungs filling with fluid and eventually suffocating them. Sometimes the person would die mercifully quickly, but other times they would linger for up to a week in perpetual misery. Scarce few survived. With such a limited understanding of medical science, those tending to the ill had no way of knowing the proper precautions to prevent the disease, and so it began spreading not only from fleas, but between people as well. Families would quickly be wiped out, and physicians began dying at terrifying rates. Those physicians who still lived fled the infected areas, leaving the victims to their horrific fates. Villages simply disappeared, their inhabitants either dead or running, searching for shelter from the wave of death enveloping the continent. The dead were so great in number that bodies were piling up into unmanageable levels. To keep track of them, specialized men were hired by the local governments, men who would be known as plague doctors. These men were not certified physicians, and in fact, it took few credentials, if any, to become a plague doctor. What was more important was their willingness to go into the worst affected areas and tally the dead and attend to the affairs of those they left behind. For their risk, they were paid handsomely and were considered extremely valuable. While their job description seemed simple, most of them partook in the ethically dubious practice of offering treatments for the disease based on wild theories and speculation, and despite their lack of credentials, they were often trusted, perhaps out of desperation. They charged exorbitant fees, and most people were desperate enough to pay any amount for their assistance, a fact that many abused. Some, however, seemed to have an earnest interest in combating the disease, and so they began using those infected as test subjects for their potential cures, which were often simply variations on contemporary medical practices and, therefore, saw little efficacy. The plague doctors themselves often had extremely short lifespans. Since they were commonly assigned to enter areas that were most heavily affected by the Black Death, they would inevitably come into contact with those infected and the conditions under which they became ill. It's also possible that the plague doctors were unintentional plague spreaders, bringing contaminated material wherever they went. As the plague continued its march and claimed more and more victims, the population grew ever more desperate, and this manifested partially as a willingness to break social taboos. Perhaps the most notable was allowing plague doctors to perform autopsies to examine the differences in the bodies of healthy and plague-affected people. But because so little was known about bodily processes at the time, this yielded few, if any, tangible results. This desperation also manifested in the practices and treatments of the plague doctors, which turned from curious to bizarre and horrifying. One of the most brutal recorded was the practice of pouring mercury over the victim and placing them in an oven to cook. This would typically accelerate the death of the patient, leaving open, festering burn wounds and blisters. At the height of the plague, however, even the plague doctors themselves would end up abandoning their posts and fleeing, much like the physicians before them, unable to stymie the spread of the Black Death in others or even themselves. Modern estimates tend to place the total death count as up to 60% of Europe's population, with tens of millions killed. But even after it had mostly burnt out, it never entirely disappeared. 
Occasional breakouts would occur at irregular intervals, and wherever the plague went, the plague doctors were close behind with their poultices, potions, and curious remedies that, more often than not, only caused harm or accelerated death, and these practices changed little for hundreds of years. Inventive doctors would sometimes conjure new theoretical treatments, but because their knowledge still relied on the four humors and miasma theory, very few of them were successful. They began branching out from the plague to treat various other maladies, and wherever illness reared its head, the plague doctors would appear. For hundreds of years, the medical field saw little to no advancement except one. During flare-ups, some cities or towns would practice quarantine in an attempt to limit the spread, and the plague doctors would brave these infected areas, places where no others would go, tally the dead, and offer their questionable services. As time passed, their medical duties took precedence over their reporting, and the upper class would often have plague doctors attend to them to help maintain their health. Of note, Nostradamus performed limited plague doctor duties, though he denied the efficacy of his treatments. It would take almost 300 years for the practice to see significant advancement, but it would be one that cemented plague doctors as one of the most curious and terrifying pieces of European history. In the beginning of the 17th century, a man named Charles de Lorme decided to tackle the problem of the plague doctors' high mortality rate. De Lorme was a popular doctor of the kings of France and Italy, including the Medici family, and he was deeply trusted with their health and well-being. When he was practicing, there were two dominant theories of disease transmission. The first was miasma theory, which had survived along with the four humors since the Black Death. The second was the belief that diseases were somehow divinely mandated, either due to the acts of societies that went against the will of God, or through the alignment of stellar bodies, especially Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. Comets, when appearing with rainbows, were suspected of causing plague. Delorme, however, was among a scarce few who considered a third possibility, that disease, through some unknown device, could jump from person to person. With this in mind, he set to work on his specialized garment. His proposal was to cover the doctor in what he imagined to be armor against disease, which would cover him entirely from head to toe. For this purpose, he designed a waxed leather coat, boots, leggings, and gloves. His theory was that, when the disease attempted to jump from the victim's body to the doctor's, the waxed leather would catch it and hold it instead, protecting the man inside. Since these men had come to be known as healers more than talliers of the dead, the costume also included a wide-brimmed hat, a common sign of a medical man. They also were to bring with them a cane, which they would use to interact with their patients without having to touch them and risk the disease jumping to them. They would even use them to check a patient's pulse. But the most striking element of the costume was the beaked mask. Not content to apply only his less popular theory, the mask was designed to defend the user against miasma, the foul-smelling air that supposedly carried disease. The belief that had long been held was that good-smelling herbs could ward off miasma, but this mask expanded the idea. The doctor was to stuff strong-smelling herbs into the beaks so that, when breathing through the two nose holes, the rancid scent of miasma would be overwhelmed by the herbs. Some doctors even set the herbs smoldering to enhance the effect. The costume in its entirety was horrifying to behold. Waxing the leather made it incredibly dark, sometimes almost black, and the glassy eyes on the mask gave the face an inhuman quality. Despite this, it didn't take long for the suit to see popular use, and the beaked doctors became a common sight. Sooner than anyone expected, however, the suits would face the ultimate test. For nearly 300 years, the bubonic plague had been coursing its way through Europe, flaring and subsiding in unpredictable patterns until 1629, when the Black Death suddenly struck Italy again, in what's come to be known as the Great Plague of Milan. This plague struck both the countryside and the cities, including the eponymous Milan, Verona, Florence, and most notably, Venice. After a decade for the plague doctors to grow used to their outfits, they were put to work. But the results were abysmal. 
No matter how certain the doctors were of their treatments and cures, they almost universally failed. In fact, the newfound confidence in their outfits may have made things worse. Since they would generally not change clothes, it's entirely possible that they were spreading contaminated material, especially with their canes. Though the outfits did manage to create a barrier of protection for the doctors against the patient and protected against human-to-human -human propagation, there was one major oversight. It didn't stop the other cause of the disease, the fleas. The suit covered the person from head to toe, but the user's skin was not completely sealed, leaving the ankles open beneath the coat. Ankles were a favorite place for the infected fleas to attack, and they would creep underneath the coat to bite, meaning that the infection rates of the plague doctors were still extremely high. Rather than becoming a symbol of wellness and hope, the monstrous visage of the plague doctor came to be associated with agony, terror, and disease. Sometimes, the population of an area or district would remain unaware of an infection in their neighborhood until the plague doctor arrived, and so he became a portent of death that would stalk the streets, invading homes and only leaving for good when most or all of the people in the area were dead. By the plague's end, over one million people had died, wiping out anywhere between a tenth and a third of the city's populations. The plague doctors themselves, realizing quickly that the outfits only had a limited effect, began abandoning their posts once again. By the end, nearly all had either disappeared or died. Still, the mark of the plague doctor remains through to today in Venice, where a special mask for carnivals based on the plague doctors is still worn as a reference to the death and disease experienced. The outfit also saw use during the plague of 1656 in Naples with similarly disastrous effects, but after this outbreak, the Black Death finally began to subside in Europe, and so too did the Plague Doctors. Though the Middle East still saw outbreaks in the 1800s, the Plague Doctors never became a phenomenon there, remaining a strictly European practice. Still, miasma theory and the four humors remained the dominant medical wisdom for almost 200 more years until germ theory supplanted it at the turn of the 20th century. Today, the image of the plague doctor retains its association with terror and pain, but with the advent of germ theory, it has taken on a new meaning. Certainty in ignorance.